Okay, good morning, everybody. This is a new uh, colloquio, colloquium by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Rosario Bruneto from the University of Paris Saclay. And he will talk about asteroid sample return. Sorry, asteroid sample return a laboratory perspective. Uh, Rosario will be properly introduced by uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez, who is the um, scientific director of the, our Severo Ochoa program. Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks to, a lot for being here again for this new Severo Ochoa colloquium at the IAA, online, of course, as it has asked to be in this period. Um, first, I'd like to, to, to acknowledge Rosario Brunetto for, uh, for accepting our invitation to be here today with us. And, um, and, and to uh, extend the invitation for an in-person one in the future when, when possible. It would be a pleasure for us to, to have you here uh, in, in true 3D as, as, as it should be. Uh, so Rosario Brunetto is an astrophysicist. Um, uh, in fact, he is a charge de recherche at the CNRS, uh, CNRS uh, at the um, Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale in Orsay in France uh, since uh, 2011. He is an expert in, in space uh, weathering of small bodies in the solar system and in micro infrared and micro Raman laboratory analysis of extraterrestrial terrestrial materials like meteorites, interplanetary dust, asteroidal and cometary grains from uh, uh, sample return missions. He's head of the astrochemistry laboratory at the IAS in Orsay and long-term collaborator for the SMIS infrared beam like of Synchrotron Soleil in, in France. He's involved in the Hayabusa 2 from the uh, Japan Space Agency JAXA sample return mission, both in the remote characterization of the asteroid uh, Ryugu, if it's, if it's pronounced like that, and in the laboratory analysis of the collected samples. He made, uh, he made his PhD in astrophysics at the Universidad del Salento in Italy. And afterwards he performed several postdocs and research fellows in places like the ESMO in Orsay and ESEIS in Orsay in France, in France and the, the Universi uh, Universita Partenopne in Napoli in Italy and the ESA ISAC in, in, in Madrid in Spain. Uh, during this, this time he has been a PI or co-PI of a number of uh, projects, mainly concerning the instrumentation for the spacecraft from the JAXA um, uh, Hayabusa 2, like the NIRS uh, 3 imaging spectrometer, the micro mega microspectrometer on board mascot, uh, or the stone initial analysis system. Uh, he's also associated scientist uh, to the uh, uh, MAGIS spectrometer of the JUICE mission uh, uh, from the ESA, an associated scientist of the sim sim symbiosis instrument for uh, Bepi Colombo, uh, also an ISA mission. Um, as the honors he have been received is to, to, I mean, to be stressed, the one concerning uh, uh, the name of the main Albert asteroid A253, which, which is called by his name, uh, Brunetto. Uh, moreover, he has published uh, about 80 peer-reviewed publications with the more than 2000 citations. And today, as René told us, he's talking about asteroid sample return uh, laboratory perspective. So uh, uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Brunetto, and thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And the board is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you all for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, be virtually with you to present this, uh, these results. I really hope I can come uh, again to Granada soon in the future. Uh, I have very good memories the last time I came, so uh, it will be a pleasure to come back. So uh, yes, as you said, I will be talking about asteroid sample return. Um, I will provide the laboratory perspective. Uh, I am a laboratory guy myself. I work in a lab um, in Orsay, as, uh, as Isabel uh, described and mentioned. And I perform a lot of experiments at the uh, synchrotron uh, Soleil that you can see in the bottom right image. Uh, here on the screen. I will talk about results that uh, were obtained by the Hayabusa 2 uh, missions as well. So most of the things that I will show uh, come from a collaboration, of course, with many people. Uh, and uh, the Hayabusa 2 uh, mission is a Japanese mission. So I have to acknowledge, of course, uh, all the Japanese colleagues who are uh, responsible for this mission. I will show uh, 
uh, names later. Okay, so we'll talk about asteroids today and uh, why that? Uh, asteroids are really key witnesses of a complex history, the history of our, of our own solar system. They, uh, they witness all the processes that shape our solar system. We have a sketch here showing the present day architecture of our solar system and uh, how it is a result, for instance, of complex dynamical processes like uh, the giant planet migration and how somehow the small bodies in general and asteroids in particular recorded all these phases uh, both in their dynamical properties, but also in their physical and chemical properties and in their composition. Uh, so by studying the uh, composition of these bodies, we have a direct access to uh, processes of formation and evolution of solids in our solar system of many, many, many years ago. And we have really a, a sketch of how it used to be our solar system in its beginning. Now, one of the, uh, of course, uh, main tools to study asteroids is to observe them and to measure uh, their um, spectral properties by accessing, let's say, by measuring the spectral, the reflectance spectral of asteroids, uh, we can access absorption uh, bands uh, in their spectra. You have a sketch here showing these little spaghettis, as you can see, these are actually visible in near infrared spectra of asteroids. Asteroids are not uh, equal, uh, let's say are not uh, identical. Uh, they come in very different classes. Uh, astronomers have built classifications for asteroids based on their uh, uh, spectral properties. And in some of these classes, you can observe absorption bands. And these absorption bands are characteristic of typical minerals that you find at the surface of these asteroids. So we have a, a tool to access the mineralogy and the composition of these bodies. And in some cases, we also have very good match between the spectral uh, properties, the, the spectra that we measure of these asteroids with meteorites that we have in the lab. And when we, we, and when we can do that, uh, then we have a lot of information, of course, because we have the actual samples in the lab, like this famous case of the V-type asteroids and of in particular the HED meteorites that, are, that come from Vesta, for instance, we have samples in the lab. So we, we know a lot of things about, about these bodies, how they form, how they evolve. The problem is that we do not have samples for all uh, the classes of, of asteroids. Actually, the majority of asteroids are probably unsampled by our meteorite collections. There is a huge bias in the material that we receive um, on Earth. And in particular, there's a huge bias for all those classes which are uh, the most difficult to, uh, to uh, study in a way because they are very dark, they are featureless in the sense of their spectra. So we don't have much uh, information from their spectra and they probably, uh, these are the ones that are probably organic rich and probably even water rich. So these are probably the most interesting if we want to study how the organic materials and how water um, let's say, uh, distributed across our system in particular at the beginning of, uh, of the history of our solar system. So there is, there is a way to actually uh, have samples from these objects is to go collect them and bring them back to the earth. And this is, this is why there is this renewed interest in the uh, sample return by many agencies. We're living really in a new uh, era of solar system exploration. Uh, we have at least six sample return missions in the next 10 years from different space agencies. Of course, not only from small bodies, also from satellites, at some point maybe from Mars, we will see. Uh, but it's really a very, very, uh, very rich uh, context, the one of the sample return that will give us direct access to samples that come from a diversity of objects with very different evolutionary paths. Uh, and we have to understand why this diversity, how this diversity uh, started, how this diverse, diversity evolved. Um, so it, it, is, it is something really, really important. And uh, one of the key uh, ideas also in this idea of taking samples and bringing them back to the earth is also that somehow to understand the large scale assembly of materials that we observe in small bodies or in satellites or in planets even, uh, we have to understand the physical and chemical processes that operate at much smaller scale, that there is a link between the micro scale and the macroscopic scale. And this brings, uh, of course, this idea of the multi-scale uh, approach that I'm trying to uh, summarize here in this sketch. You see, uh, I will 
today I will talk about Hayabusa 2 also as an example of how we can uh, put together, how we can relate, let's say, the remote sensing studies at large scale to the in-situ measurements at smaller scale, like meter scale, centimeter scale, let's say, and eventually to the uh, uh, um, analysis in the lab uh, at much smaller scale, micron scale, where we have direct access to the actual processes that shape and, and this material. And so by linking remote sensing in situ and the lab, we are also linking uh, large scale to small scale. Uh, my presentation today uh, will focus about the lab, but of course, in the first part of my presentation, I will show some results from Hayabusa 2 um, from the remote sensing and the in situ measurements. Uh, of course, by no means, this will be a comprehensive summary of the results of the mission. Mission is extremely rich. I participated only in a small uh, part of it. I am co I of one instrument and one instrument on the ground. So I only, my contribution, of course, is very small. Uh, but I decided to take a few key results that are interesting for what I want to show in terms of laboratory experiments and laboratory analysis. And also in my in second part of my talk, I will show how the lab is important, of course, not only because we analyze the lab, the samples in the lab, but also because in the lab, we can perform experiments on analogs. We can reproduce in the lab processes, uh, astrophysical processes. And so the experiments that we performed in the lab are very important uh, as a support uh, in the interpretation of what we observe remotely. So there's really a loop that links the remote sensing to the in situ to the lab. And then, then in the last part of my talk, I will show you a few things about the uh, actual uh, sample collection and curation. And uh, I will say a few words of what's going to happen next. Of course, things are ongoing now. The, the uh, analysis are, uh, just started, so I cannot show much, unfortunately, but I will give you an idea of what could be uh, some of the examples of what the, the laboratory analysis could be. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about what we saw with, uh, with Hayabusa 2. So Hayabusa 2 is a JAXA mission, a Japanese mission, I think we have to uh, congratulate our Japanese colleague for ver this very successful mission. It's a, it's, a, it's a compact mission. It's been extremely efficient and uh, extremely successful in all the different phases in characterizing its target, uh, the asteroid Ryugu, uh, from a distance at the surface, uh, in proximity, collecting samples, bringing them back. Hayabusa 2 carried uh, a compact payload uh, a navigation camera, ONC, laser altimeter, a near-infrared spectrometer, NIRS-3. Uh, so I participated myself in this experiment. And then there was also a very interesting thermal infrared camera. But uh, the other uh, uh, nice thing about Hayabusa 2 is that the Japanese colleagues managed to uh, uh, accommodate on board a number of small landers and rovers. This was spectacular. We had the possibility of having images from the surface of the asteroids. Uh, there is a, a one module, the lander mascot, which was provided by, uh, by the DLR and the CNES. And of course, the first objective, of the, the main objective of the mission was to collect the samples. And so you see here the sample horn that was used to collect the samples that was successful. We, I will show you that two uh, sample collections were performed and now we have the samples in the lab. So here's our target, the little asteroid uh, Ryugu. Uh, it's a near Earth asteroid. It is, it is small. It's uh, only about uh, 500 meters in, in diameter. It has this very peculiar uh, top shape uh, with this circular equatorial bulge. Um, the top shape is a consequence of its history, of course. Uh, I'll say a few words later. Um, what is very interesting to me uh, is the fact that the asteroid is very uh, is not very dense actually. Its, dent is, its density is only 1.19 grams per cubic centimeter, uh, and this implies, of course, that if you take meteorites as a reference for the uh, uh, constituents of this asteroid, then to explain this low density, you, you you have to invoke a very high porosity. Maybe the other possibility is that. Uh, the asteroid, the meteorites that we have in the lab are not good analogs. So maybe the composition of this asteroid is different. It's made of materials that are lighter in a way. It is a rubble pile. It's formed by the reaccretion of fragments of a larger body after disruption by an impact, most probably. As you can see from these images already, it's uh, a very rich in, uh, there's a high abundance of large boulders as it's at its surface. So let's go straight to the, uh, to the uh, spectral characteristic of this body. Uh, in this image, uh, you have a compilation of three spectra. In black, you have the spectrum measured by the NIRS-3 instrument. 
um, it's a large scale, let's say, uh, measurement. It, it, it averages uh, measurements taken at large scale at the asteroid. In red, you have uh, points, uh, spectrophotometric points measured by the, the filters on board the ONC uh, uh, instrument. And then in gray, you have uh, a spectrum measured by uh, ground-based observations. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we use spectroscopy as a, as a tool to uh, have information, to gain information about the composition of this body. Uh, what's striking here, and already at the first few is that you see the spectrum is extremely flat. Uh, it's very dark, uh, the object is very dark, the reflectance is always below 2%. This is a very dark surface, you have to imagine this really something really bad. It, it, it's uh, one of the darkest surfaces, I think, that we ever uh, visited. And, uh, and also, we don't see many features, actually. The only feature, the main feature that we can see is this little band here, which is actually a weak absorption, uh, 2.72 microns. And by analogy with what we observe in some meteorites and what we know from terrestrial analogs, uh, this feature can be easily attributed to hyd hydrated minerals in general. Hydrated minerals meaning, for instance, filosilicates. silicates. However, it's, it is very weak, uh, but it is observed uh, basically across the entire body. So we believe these minerals must exist uh, in the entire body. Its uh, characteristics are uh, also quite, uh, I'd say, um, stable in a sense there. The surface of the asteroid seems to be very homogeneous at the scale of a uh, few meters. Uh, the spectrum doesn't change much uh, when you study, let's say, spectra across the asteroid at the scale of a few meters. The, the band position and the, uh, uh, and the center, uh, say the center of the band and the band depth remain uh, basically the same. So now let's have a look at the comparison between uh, Ryugu and meteorites that we have in the lab. Uh, it is uh, certainly, uh, we can certainly say that uh, we do not have a good match of the spectrum of Ryugu with any known meteorite. So basically we do not have a meteorite in the lab that reproduces the spectrum of Ryugu. This is very important. Uh, it's actually good news. It means that probably we are sampling something that we do not have in our collection as we wanted, actually. Uh, there are analogies, of course, with, uh, with meteorites, similarities, I would say. Uh, in some cases, uh, for instance, some colleagues uh, performed experiments uh, taking uh, very known meteorites coming from the CI or the CM class, and they, uh, for instance, heated them or shocked them. And, uh, and you can see, for instance, in this case on the right, that in some, you may have some similarities with meteorites that have been uh, heated in the lab, actually, uh, to high temperature. Uh, so, based on this first comparison, um, one of the uh, one of the things that we uh, that we uh, stated in this paper already uh, it was that to, in order to explain this very weak uh, hydration feature, either the asteroid was not so hydrous since its beginning, or it has been hydrated and then dehydrated by a secondary process, some sort of heating process or shock. It could have been a, a, a heating process in the parent body, or it could be a heating process later on during the history of Ryugu, for instance, when Ryugu approaches the sun. Uh, we didn't know, of course, at that time. Uh, but that's, that's very interesting. And what about the comparison between Ryugu and asteroids? So from a general, uh, let's say, general uh, point of view, uh, the visible spectra, visible and near-infrared spectra view have been compared also with asteroids. And we, we, we know, let's say, some colleagues have speculated about the fact that Ryugu might actually come from uh, the uh, Polaria or uh, Euralia family, uh, Polaria or Euralia families in the uh, main asteroid belt. So we might have links to known asteroid families. But what is very uh, interesting to me is to compare Ryugu with another famous asteroid, uh, Bennu, which is the target of the OSIRIS-REx mission, uh, the NASA mission. Uh, the two asteroids share so many similarities. They are similar in size. They have very similar albedo, very, both very dark. Um, they, they have it's very similar shape, actually. Uh, the density is also somehow similar. Maybe Ben is a little bit denser. But what is striking is to see how the uh, spectra are different. The near-infrared spectra uh, are different in the sense that the uh, 2.7 uh, micron feature associated to a hydrated minerals is much weaker in Ryugu and much pronounced, much more pronounced in Bennu. Actually, the uh, feature on Bennu resembles a lot uh, similar features that we see on common meteorites. Uh, and also what is interesting is that 
you do not find on Ryugu a single location with a spectrum similar to Bennu, and you do not find on Bennu uh, any position with uh, any location or structure with a similar spectrum as Ryugu. So the two asteroids are really different in their bulk composition or in the process uh, that they experienced after the formation. So that's, I think, very interesting. So I mentioned the fact that the uh, um, this hydration feature is, is very stable across the asteroid. It's actually uh, not true, 100% uh, true. They, we, have, we see little variations, um, but they always are within, let's say, 10%. So we were, of course, uh, looking for potential uh, variations and to see if these variations were associated to any geomorphological features, craters, uh, rims, or any sort of structures, fractures, and so on. Uh, and from the near infrared, it was not—it was not so clear that we could actually relate this little variation to geomorphological feature. Uh, but data coming from the other experiment, from the camera, uh, for the other instrument, show that there are actually uh, variations at maybe a little bit smaller scale that uh, could be uh, uh, could be significant. Uh, in particular, uh, the uh, team led by Seiji Sugita um, show that uh, there are differences in uh, spectral slope and albedo, in particular, the, uh, the equatorial ridge is bluer than the rest of the asteroid, as you can see. But what is most uh, probably most interesting observation from the camera is this work that uh, has been uh, recently submitted by Eri Tatsumi. I'm advertising your work. It's a very nice paper uh, showing that the poles of Ryugu uh, have different uh, spectra, actually, than the rest of the asteroid, in which respect in which sense well they have uh, they have a spectrum that is bluer than the rest of the asteroid and they probably show a, a weak 0.7 micron absorption feature that is uh, also associated to hydrated minerals and that is observed some sometimes on meteorites and aster and on hydrated asteroids and so based on these two uh, evidences one of the things that one can speculate is that actually there are variations of composition on the surface that may reflect uh, different processes, let's say, the, or different ages at the surface. Uh, this idea that uh, some regions uh, on the surface of the asteroid may be younger than others. And so maybe what we are seeing at the poles is uh, the presence of more pristine material uh, that was not uh, heavily uh, heated or irradiated. Uh, so, and this observation gives me the opportunity to switch to the second part of my talk, where I will show how uh, to better understand these processes taking place at the surface of these bodies, we actually can use laboratory experiments as, as constraints and to reproduce these processes in the lab. Um, and in particular, I will talk about the energetic processes uh, altering the surface of asteroids. Uh, so as, as, you can, as you can easily uh, uh, guess, Ryugu, for instance, has no protection at the surface for, from, uh, let's say, the uh, harsh environment uh, in space. Its surface is heated, uh, its surface is irradiated by ions coming from the sun, coming from the galactic cosmic rays as well. And so these processes, common, let's say, uh, globally called space weathering, uh, what they do is they actually modify the optical properties of the surface material. And since we, we, we are using reflectance uh, measurements to, uh, to uh, study th their composition, well, th our measurements are probably biased. And if we want to understand what is actually the, the real composition of the underlying materials, we have somehow to de-bias this, remote, this, this uh, remote sensing observation by understanding space weathering. And uh, since this process is dependent, typically depends on time, so we have this knowledge, this, this notion of exposure time, um, we might actually use, if we understand this process well, well, we might actually use it to estimate the age of a surface. One of the ideas be behind this is to be able to say, hey, look, that region of the asteroid is older than another region, for instance, and that will be independent from dynamical studies. So it'll be very interesting to be able to do that. Now, this process has been studied since the 70s, thanks to the lunar samples, of course, and it is active all across the solar system. But what is important to me here is that uh, it can be reproduced. It can be reproduced in the lab. Uh, and that's what we do with these experiments that we built uh, in Orsay, where we have a vacuum chamber where we can um, uh, put meteorites or analogs, let's say solid samples, and we can irradiate them with an ion beam 
We typically use hydrogen, helium, or argon, or other easy ions, I would say, in the energy uh, range of uh, 5 to 40 keV. So this is the range uh, that reproduces this low solar wind irradiation. And we can monitor the evolution of the spectra of the, of the meteorites before, during, and after irradiation with visible and infrared uh, light, uh, either in uh, reflectance or transmission. Uh, it's going to be reflectance, of course, in the case of meteorites. And we can actually control even the sample temperature. Uh, although for the experiments that we show later, we use the room temperature as, uh, as a standard. And after we are done with the experiment, uh, we can actually remove the sample from the chamber. Uh, we bring it to uh, Soleil, to the synchrotron, and we can perform additional measurements in the larger spectral range. So uh, this, we started a campaign of measurements a few years ago already, and we published a number of papers on this uh, subject. And we try to focus on carbonaceous chondrites uh, in the context, of course, of Hayabusa 2 and Osiris Rex, uh, whose targets are carbonaceous, uh, probably carbon-rich asteroids. And uh, for these, uh, we decided to uh, take several meteorites from different classes in order to explore different composition, of course, and in particular, uh, different meteorites showing different degrees of uh, thermal metamorphism or aqueous alteration to have as, as many analogs as possible. Um, and so in the first uh, part of our studies, we, uh, we tried to look for proxies. What we wanted to have is find good proxies for the irradiation, find good spectroscopic proxies that could tell us uh, whether a surface is irradiated or not, whether it's old or young. And uh, in order to do that, we had to look at the visible and near infrared spectra of the meteorites. Uh, before and after irradiation, because this range, the visible in the near infrared, is the one that is most commonly observed, the surface of, the surface of asteroids, as I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, it's, it's also because this range has been widely used in the study of lunar space weathering or S-type asteroid space weathering. So uh, we wanted to find good proxies there. And we were surprised to discover that uh, some, some meteorites behave uh, in a way that the spectra change after irradiation with a clear darkening of, the, of, of their albedo and, uh, and the spectral uh, slope changes in terms of uh, uh, it becomes redder. But for other meteorites, it's actually the opposite. Uh, we observe a bluing and we observe a brightening of their spectra. Uh, so we, we believe, uh, we, we, uh, we demonstrated that actually this different, these two different behaviors are related to the original composition. And I, I don't want to go into the details, but basically it's a game of uh, modifying the optical properties of something that is already very dark. And so depending on the original composition, you have, of course, uh, different um, refractive index and, and the materials will behave differently. And so this is why in some cases you have a brightening or in some cases you have a darkening. But the main message here is that since the variations depend on the composition, uh, different, different uh, meteorites will behave differently. If we don't know the, the original composition of the material, then we don't know what is the trend, right? And so in this respect, the visible and the near infrared albedo and slopes uh, are not unambiguous. Uh, proxies of irradiation. So the, you may have ambiguities. It, you cannot unambiguously say, oh, that based on the albedo only or the slope only, oh, that region is older, that region is younger. So we had to look for other proxies. In order to do that, we uh, went to the infrared, uh, in the mid infrared and in the far infrared. And uh, the, be the beauty, of course, of the mid and the far infrared is that you have access to fundamental vibration uh, vibrations. Uh, you, you have access to the uh, SIO, for instance, stretching bands and SIO bending modes of the silicates that compose the meteorites. Silicates are the main com uh, component of the meteorites, of course. Uh, you have an example here. This is a meteorite uh, that has been heated, uh, thermally metamorphized. It's rich in olivine, for instance. You see all these bands are characteristic of olivine. And in this other case, another famous meteorite, Dagish Lake, uh, it is a meteorite that has been uh, um, um, altered by aqueous alteration. So you have hydrated minerals, phyllosilicates in particular. So these bands are characteristic of phyllosilicate. And so the, uh, since we have these beautiful uh, diagnostic bands, we can have a look at what happens after irradiation. And the spectra after irradiation, the ones shown here in gray, well, uh, you can see that the features are modified both in shape, uh, in intensity, relative intensities, and uh, most significantly in, in peak position. So the peak position of the bands change uh, they, uh, the bands are all red shifted after irradiation. Uh, the peak position moves towards the large wavelengths. 
And, and so we said, oh, this is actually something interesting. We might have an interesting proxy here because the, 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 the striking thing is that this trend is observed for all meteorites. So this, this uh, uh, band shift really emerges as a general trend. We observed that in all meteorites that we irradiated and even on terrestrial uh, minerals that we irradiated as analogs. The reason for that, of course, has to do with the uh, actual physical and chemical modifications that we introduce in the sample when we irradiate the sample. We are amorphizing minerals, we are stressing the crystal uh, structure, and that for some reasons are a little bit long to explain, but that introduces a, a, a shift of the bands, basically. But what is interesting in the, in the sense of the astronomical point of view is that we can use that as a proxy now. And uh, for instance, if you have a look here at this uh, right images, you see here, this is one of our meteorite. You have a visible image of the meteorite. You don't see much. Uh, well, actually, we irradiated this meteorite with, on, uh, with two uh, different irradiations. So there are two irradiation spots, but in the visible, you don't see much, right? But if you have a look at the infrared, and in particular, you plot the uh, peak position of the main olivine band. Well, then you see clearly detect the two irradiation spots. One was uh, with using helium at a relatively high influence, high influence, and the other was the other one was produced by irradiating with argon at uh, lower uh, high influence. So this is a good proxy, and also it looks like we can actually separate the irradiation effect from the nat natural heterogeneity of the material. Meteorites are, are extremely heterogeneous at the scale of few, few uh, microns, few tens of microns. Uh, and so um, we wanted to look that uh, uh, in, in, in space, actually, in real observ asteroid observations. But uh, of course, the mid-infrared and the far-infrared uh, ranges are observed on asteroids, but not so many asteroids. And we do not have many asteroids with the good signal-to-noise spectra in order to do that. But we have one case, actually, where we could do that. It is The case is the one of Bennu, the target of OSIRIS-REx. So OSIRIS-REx carries uh, an instrument that can measure in the mid and the far-infrared, OTES. It has, so the asteroid has been characterized also by this instrument. And so we said, well, we should check that. And you see here, this is the average spectrum of, uh, of Bennu measured by OSIRIS-REx. And you have here uh, an example of uh, uh, two, uh, uh, a mixture of two uh, unirradiated meteorites that are considered good analogs for Bennu. They are both hydrated uh, meteorites. Uh, and well, you see that you can recognize the general shape and you can recognize the main uh, features, of course, to the, to, to the uh, stretching and bending modes of the uh, SIO bands and the phyllosilicates, but the position don't match, actually. And so what happens if you irradiate these meteorites? Well, in this case, uh, you see that the band position uh, changes and you have a much better match with, uh, of course, the peak position that you observe on Bennu. So we thought th this is actually a good hint that the fact that the, the surface of Bennu might be irradiated. And people always ask us, but okay, this is what you see in the lab, but how we sure, are we sure this process is actually uh, efficient in space? How do we know it is efficient in space? And uh, in order to answer this question, well, two things I want to, uh, to stress. Well, first thing is uh, actually you see that when you when you follow the evolution of the of for instance the big position of one of the olivine bands or the philosophical bands, you always see that the process kind of tends to saturate at some point. And uh, the uh, the uh, typical fluences that we use in the lab correspond to relatively short time scales at one AU. So few uh, few uh, let's say. 10 to the 10 to the second 10 to the fourth year so it's really it's really an efficient process and of course the other uh, independent confirmation of this comes from the fact that we had already a sample return mission from an asteroid it was itokawa by uh, the hayabusa one uh, jaxa mission and uh, uh, other colleagues uh, show that uh, we actually have the signs of this radiation on the surface of the grains and the by estimating the exposure time, thanks to noble gases, they found similar time scales. So it is really, really a fast process. And we, uh, we expect this process to be uh, operating all, at the surface of all near Earth asteroids. Oh, by the way, this uh, thing also I wanted to mention is that this shift it should be observable with uh, James Webb with uh, the MIRI instrument on board James Webb. We'll see, we're not sure this will work, but we'll see. Okay, so we wanted to do the same thing on Ryugu, but the problem is Ryugu doesn't carry uh, an instrument uh, that can measure the, the spectrum in the, in the mid and the far infrared. So we said, okay, we, sh we should do that by looking at the 2.7 micron band that is observed on Ryugu. And so um, for that, we, uh, we took uh, several terrestrial analogs a different, uh, say, different phyllosilicates. This is work by my PhD student. Um, he, what he did, he took 
several uh, terrestrial analogs, uh, different compositions, saponite, serpentine, and so on. And he radiated them and followed the evolution in the vacuum chamber. This is important. Um, we didn't want to expose the samples to the atmospheric uh, water conditions, of course, in order to make sure that what we are observing really is in the, in the sample and uh, you want to be as close as possible to the conditions in space. And you see here that for some samples, for instance, the first case here at the top, this is a saponite. Well, the irradiation doesn't change much the spectrum, right? Uh, but for other uh, minerals, such as kind of serpentines, for instance, you clearly see a shift of the, of the band, just like we saw before in the infrared, in the mid infrared. And this shift uh, is something like 10, 20 nanometers. So it's, it's, it's measurable. It's small, but it's measurable. And another important point here is that by shifting the band position, also what we are doing is what we are producing a bias in the remote sensing detection. Actually, uh, phyllosilicates showing positions closer to 2.7 tend to be magnesium rich. Uh, position, big positions, uh, let's say closer to 2.4, 2.5, uh, sorry, 2.74, 75, um, is, uh, tend to be a more iron rich. So there is a link, of course, between the, uh, the, the band position and the actual mineralogy and the composition. Well, by depleting this, uh, this region of positions, because we introduce an artificial shift, uh, we are inducing a bias in the remote sensing. So that's kind of important. And uh, another interesting point is that this effect is not observable I mean, it's observable at all geometries, but it's particularly efficient at, 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 at some geometries. So the geometry of, of observation can be also important. And this may have important force consequences uh, in terms of the remote sensing. Okay, so we thought that we could observe this on Ryugu. And what better chance than using, of course, uh, this uh, beautiful experiment that was performed by the project. You may know that uh, Hayabusa 2 also carried an impactor. Uh, uh, this experiment, the SCI um, impact. Uh, so fire this projectile, uh, two kilos projectile on the surface, uh, producing a crater. The crater uh, measured something like uh, 17 uh, meters in diameter. Uh, the depth was a few meters. The uh, ejecta were, were, uh, were actually imaged by a deployable camera. It was spectacular. Um, and of course, the area was uh, measured before and after the impact. And thanks to the NEARS-3 uh, spectrometer, we were, able, we were able to measure the spectrum of, in this region within the crater, around the crater, um, across the crater. Um, and you have here the results. So what we showed here in this figure, and it came out, this paper came out this year, um, is uh, the uh, different spectra of different, uh, you see, locations uh, around the crater. And uh, the spectra have been uh, normalized to the average spectrum uh, of the surface standard. So they're ratioed, they're ratioed to the, uh, basically the average spectrum of an undisturbed surface of view around this area. And so if nothing happens, well, then you have uh, a straight 100% a straight uh, flat spectrum, right? Uh, but if there is some difference, then we should see something here. And this is what happens. You see, for instance, this is region one, so far from the crater, no variations. But if you go uh, through the crater, so for instance, four and six on here, or five, five, what is five? Five is the area of the ejecta of the crater, actually. Well, you see variations. And what do we see? Well, first we see that there is an additional 2.7 band. This is just like the 2.7 micron band that we see across the, the asteroid, except its position is a little bit shifted. You see this dashed line represents the peak position that we observe in, in, in an undisturbed surface of Ryugu, so an old surface, we might say. And this is what we observe in the, in the young surface that has been exposed. So the peak position is a little bit shifted uh, to the short wavelengths. And the, the amount of the shift is really comparable with what we observe in our laboratory experiments. So we think that this is potential sign of space weathering of Ryugu. Uh, and, and so that's, we'll see. We will see if that is the case in the laboratory uh, measurements of the return sample. But there's another important point here is the fact that actually by exp exposing uh, excavated material at the surface, very young material, we, one might expect actually to show, to, 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 to measure something completely different, but th that's not the case. The 2.7 microman is still there. And it's still weak, even if it's a little bit deeper and a little bit shifted, but it's still uh, comparable to the average aster, which means that the, uh, what we, that the whole Ryugu has been somehow dehydrated at some point. So that was very important in terms of understanding the process of evolution of the asteroid.
Okay, so why am I talking about this? Is also because we actually sampled uh, Hayabusa 2, the project, sampled uh, the, uh, the material that was excavated. So the second touchdown point was uh, uh, in the uh, ejecta of the crater. Uh, the first touchdown point was uh, close to the equator in an undisturbed area. So we have two touchdown points and two sample collections were successfully performed. This was spectacular. So we, have, we think we have samples from surface and subsurface material. So this is gonna be very important to uh, address all these secondary effects as I said, the space weathering, heating at the surface and so on, when we will analyze this in the lab. Okay, so before I move to the last part of my talk, the laboratory results, um, I want to show uh, this spectacular image that was uh, uh, taken by the MASCAM instrument on board uh, MASCOT, the lander MASCOT by DLR and the CNES. Uh, this experiment uh, performed by our German colleagues was extremely successful. Uh, they managed to uh, produce these spectacular images at the surface of the asteroid. And uh, one of the uh, most striking things was that uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning that the asteroid, in terms of spectral properties, is quite uniform at large scale. And uh, we really wanted to see if that at the small scale, this, uh, this uh, homogeneity disappears somehow and the, and the natural heterogeneity of the material starts to emerge, just like we see in meteorites. Uh, so the, uh, the German colleagues uh, showed that they were able, actually able to detect small inclusions of brighter uh, spots or darker spots, sometimes color spots, uh, maybe millimeter size, maybe even smaller and not easy to say. But uh, of course, everybody thought about um, chondrules, uh, inclusions, uh, similar to things we observe in meteorites. We'll see in a minute that this is probably not 100% sure, but, the, but these variations are certainly real. Okay, so before I move to the last part, just as a little summary, this, this sketch was, uh, uh, was prepared by Seiji uh, Sugita. So the, uh, the team of the camera, uh, thanks to the, their observation, they uh, start, started building a scenario of formation and evolution of the asteroid. They have uh, good reasons for uh, um, saying that the uh, that Ryugu was actually impacted at least twice by an impactor that is prob was probably uh, an S-type asteroid, they, they, they think they see re, uh, remnants of this at the surface of Ryugu. There are boulders, there are S-type boulders, so it's sort of ex exogenous material. And um, th so there was at some, at some point uh, a parent body that was impacted, the, some of the fragments reaccumulated. We had an intermediate, probably a parent body, a second impact, uh, the formation of, uh, of Ryugu that was very fast uh, it was spinning very fast. That's what produced this shape, uh, typical top shape. And then it, the, the spinning slowed down, slowed down little, uh, little by little. And uh, it seems that uh, there are constraints about the uh, potential uh, excursion of, uh, of Ryu close to the sun, which might have produced this heating at the surface probably, but still, this is still to be uh, understood. Okay, so now the samples are on Earth. Uh, Ayabusa 2 collected 5.5 grams. It was successful. It was much more than they expected, actually. So again, uh, congratulations to uh, JAXA and the Japanese community for, uh, for this achievement. Um, you, you, you certainly have seen this image uh, of the uh, grains extracted from room A and room C. So these are the two collections that I mentioned, the first touchdown and the second touchdown. And the samples are now uh, at the curation facility at ISAS. Uh, in Japan, close to Tokyo, uh, where they are being uh, characterized, uh, cured, <laughs> and then stored. Uh, so far, the samples never experienced uh, atmospheric um, terrestrial atmosphere. So they have been stored either under vacuum or under nitrogen, which is very important. There are um, indications that uh, say suggestion that uh, the samples might be actually very reactive when exposed to the atmosphere, so it was very important to store them in a, in a, in a controlled environment. So how it's got, how things are going to happen now? Well, you, this is a little sketch showing you uh, the curation strategy of JAXA. I think this has been updated, so this is an old sketch, but uh, the idea remains the same. Uh, basically, there's this curation phase that is going on, and we are right now we are here, and uh, in June, meaning now, the uh, initial analysis teams are starting their analysis. So a little fraction of these uh, of these samples are being distributed to uh, different teams uh, led by uh, six Japanese PIs uh, that will uh, analyze um, the samples to show to the community the rich uh, the rich, uh, the richness somehow this, of this collection before the samples are actually made available for the international community in mid uh, 2022. 
So I want to say a few words about what's going on in the curation facility. Uh, I think this is interesting. I cannot say much because the, uh, many informations are confidential and uh, two papers have been submitted, but they're not published yet. So uh, stay tuned. They might come out uh, soon. We'll see. Um, what I can say is that in the curation facility, the Japanese colleagues organized uh, different measurements. So the samples are being characterized by optical images. There are filters similar to what we, uh, we saw on, uh, on the ONC instrument. Uh, the samples are being weighted um, so we can access their densities. This is very important. And then there are two uh, infrared instruments. One is a point-to-point -point FTIR microscope operating in, in the two to four uh, micron range. And another one is an infrared hyperspectral microscope called Micromega, which is provided by, uh, by France, actually by uh, IES, by, uh, by my lab. The PI is Jean-Pierre Bibring. And uh, this microscope measures uh, images and uh, hyperspectral images, actually, in the near infrared spectral range. This is an example of one of the images measured by, uh, by Micromega. And the idea here is really to build the context necessary for the uh, subsequent analysis. We are having a look at the curation at the general properties of the collection, okay, before individual grains are extracted and provided to individual teams for the uh, analysis performed in the initial analysis team. So this will be done through a catalog that's been uh, is being built right now in, uh, by JAXA. And uh, this will be distributed to the initial analysis teams and later to the whole community through the uh, announcement, announcements of opportunity. So I cannot say much about the samples, but let me just say this point, which is actually, I think, very important. So far, what we saw is that, let's say, the optical and spectral properties of the materials that we are looking at uh, confirm uh, the fact that the samples that has been corrected is really from real wood, that there's no doubt about it. And, uh, and it's actually representative of the whole aster. This is a very important uh, question in sample return mission. You have to address the fact that the, what you actually is sampling and analyzes, analyzing really uh, is applicable to the whole uh, body. So the, I think we believe this is the case. So this is very good news for the sample analysis. So I mentioned the initial analysis teams that are starting the, their work now. They are coordinated by Shogo Tachibana in Japan. They have six uh, Japanese PIs. Each PI has organized uh, a team of international scientists. Uh, so uh, myself, I belong to this uh, team led by Tomoki Nakamura. I participate in a little fraction of the analysis, of course. And uh, I cannot show you what we have because we haven't started yet. We are starting now, but I can certainly show what we want to do. And before I show you that, I was just want to want to summarize the philosophy of what we're doing here. As I mentioned since the beginning, it is very important to relate the processes that are shaping the materials at the nanometer scale, the micrometer scale, at the atomic scale, with what we observe at much larger scale with the remote sensing. In order to do that, we really have to focus on this bridge here, which is really what happens between 10 millimeters and 10 microns, uh, because that, that's where we can cross, uh, let's say, the remote sensing with the sample analysis. And in order to do that, we have to use at least once <laughs> the same technique that is used for remote sensing as a bridge for the analysis at a much smaller scale. And of course, spectroscopy is a, is a prime tool you know, to do that. And uh, this is why we are building what we call uh, multi-analytical sequences. So this, the sketch that I'm showing here is published, uh, has been published by my colleague, Alisa Leontopani. So this is uh, the multi-analytical sequence of uh, our group. But of course, each group has is, is its own uh, multi-analytical sequence. But they, they, they all uh, are similar in, a, in, in the sense that they all start from the large scale to the small scale. And also in order to maximize the scientific outcome and minimize the sample loss, remember these samples are precious, of course, uh, we want to minimize sample loss. We always start from the less destructive to the, and we go to the more and more destructive techniques. So that's why infrared, for instance, spectroscopy or infrared tomography, we'll show, I'll show you that in a, in a minute, uh, always starts uh, first. And then we have things like X-ray tomography, and then we have uh, fluorescence and so on. And then we can actually extract regions of interest. We can produce sections and then we go to more and more destructive things at small scale, TEM, nanosims, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, okay, this is the, really the general philosophy of what we're going to do. And now let me just show you to, uh, just to uh, finish uh, just a few slides about examples of uh, studies that we did on meteorites, just to give you an idea of what we can do. So the first thing we will do is we will measure the infrared characteristics of view samples at large scale, meaning millimeter scale. And we will have an, an average spectrum that we will compare with the, uh, with the uh, measurements that we have performed in the past few years on different meteorites. 
And why we want to do that? Because the 10 micron, in particular, the 10 micron region of, uh, of the spectrum is very sensitive to the hydrothermal history of these meteorites. You see here, for instance, in this plot, this is the first derivative versus the peak position of the 10 micron band. It's a way to spread the data set in 2D. But basically what you can see here, these are all different meteorites from different classes that you have the region of the less, least altered meteorites, the most primitive ones here. These are the ones that have been uh, hydrothermally uh, altered. And then here you have the anhedrous meteorites at the top left. And you can actually see here the result of an experiment that we did during the rehearsal of the Hayabusa 2 um, analysis. Uh, we, take, we took one meteorite, famous meteorite, Marches, and we heated it. Uh, this was done in Japan. And we measured the spectra, and we, see, we saw how the spectra change with, uh, with increasing heating. So we are modifying the mineralogy of this meteorite by heating. So we think by measuring the uh, spectrum of Ryugu at, uh, at small scale, we will be able to constrain the other thermal processes. Uh, but of course, we can go to a much smaller scale. We will perform uh, hyperspectral characterization, uh, hyperspectral maps of, of the grains that we will have. So this is an example of on a, on a CM meteorite, famous, uh, very primitive meteorite, Paris. Um, and so thanks to uh, our imaging microscope, we will be able to separate, uh, for instance, inclusions, chondrules, if any, we're not sure. Uh, Rigu has chondrules, maybe not. Um, metrics, different components of the metrics, evaluate, for instance, the fraction of, of hydrated versus anhydrous minerals. So we can uh, calculate model abundances. And at the same time, the spectra that we produce will be used as a link to the remote sensing observation. And we go smaller and smaller. We can do that also on small isolated grains. Uh, we will also have isolated grains sizing few tens of 100 microns. Uh, we can mount them on needles. We can perform spectroscopy at their surface. And again, we can detect regions which are hydrated and separate from the anhydrous areas. So we're really tracing the um, aqueous alteration here at the small scale or the heating processes. And in the meanwhile, we are also detecting the organics. You see here, this spectrum shows the presence of organics, CH, aliphatic stretching, uh, bending modes, OH uh, modes, uh, both in organics and in water, uh, very different from the anhydrous area, which is uh, poor in organics. And uh, so actually, let me just show you this because I think it's very funny. We, when we do that, we are treating the uh, surface of one grain as a planetary surface, basically. We have here grain sizing a few tens of microns. This is an, uh, an electronic image. Uh, we can build a mesh model. Uh, it's, it's like a shape model when you do that on asteroids. And we can project the uh, hyperspectral infrared measurements on top of that in order to be able, for instance, to detect specific regions of interest. This is a distribution of water at the surface of of the grain, you can see here there's a region rich in water, and then you can say, oh, that region is, is important. So let's go look, have a look at that. Let's section the grain at that position and let's study that with uh, more destructive techniques. Uh, and the last point is the organics. Uh, we want to also see how the organics change in the context of aqueous alteration. So if you, you're going to smaller and smaller scale. So this is a few tens of microns. And uh, here in this case, this meteorite was crashed in order to perform the measurement and transmission. And you can see here that uh, we have detection of amorphous silicates around and that there's like a band of aqueous alteration here. We see the serpentine. And exactly at, the, at those locations, you see that the organic materials uh, changes in, in nature, in particular, the ratio between CH2 to CH3 changes. So this is the kind of things that we want to do. And uh, we can actually do that now in 3D. So this is a 2D measurement, but we don't want to crash the grains, right? We don't want to destroy them. We want to do that by uh, to being totally non-destructive. And so if you put your grain on top of a needle, um, you put that uh, at, the sem uh, at the plane, a focal plane of our imaging microscope, you rotate the grain, you take 180 uh, acquisitions, what you're doing is you're reconstructing at the end the uh, uh, 3D distribution of the absorption. Uh, that's what we call a tomography, just like when you do an X-ray tomography at the hospital, except that this one is in color. Uh, each color uh, represents a phase, so silicates, carbonates, aliphatic matter, water, and so on. And this will give us a distribution of, in 3D of the, of the different phases. And then once we have selected regions of interest, like for instance here, you see this is a virtual cut so this is virtual, it's not a real cut, it's a virtual cut where you can detect, for instance, regions rich in organics. You can say, okay, let's have a look at that. And then we section the grain, uh, we recover it, we section, and then we take the section that we want for more destructive analysis. Okay, so I'll stop here. Just as a summary, I want to stress again the role that the laboratory is playing in building this efficient loop that relate, re relates to remote sensing to the in-situ and to the uh, 
um, small scale uh, analysis of this material. And I hope that uh, if I come to Granada next year, maybe I can show you some <laughs> results uh, by the end of next year, uh, the initial, actually by mid 2022, the initial analysis of free samples will be uh, done. All the papers must be published uh, before June 22, 2022. And so by then I think we will have many results to show. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to take questions, if any. Thank you very much, Rosario. <clears throat> and now I love the, the talk really. I have a lot of questions, but uh, I will open the talk for questions for the participants. So please uh, raise your hand for doing a question. Okay, Olga, go on. Hey, um very nice talk. Thank you very much. It was it was very clear. Uh, I have a question about these two samples brought back to to the earth. Uh, as, uh, do you have any analysis, or anybody has any analysis of the particle size and or uh, porosity of the particles? Because depending on the sample, they look uh, completely different as far as the size is concerned. Sorry, I lost the screen. We're out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, I'll take I'll take the PDF. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the PDF? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Olga, for the for the question. Uh, yes, it's it's a very important point. Uh, let's let's go back to the image uh, showing the collect. I'm I'm sorry I cannot show much, but uh, this oh, is this image know. belongs to the public already, so uh, we I, I think we can talk about this. Um, uh, yeah, so one of the questions is, uh, first, uh, is the size distribution uh, different between uh, uh, the first touchdown and the second touchdown? Are the porosity, uh, is the porosity different? The densities, are they different? So these are very important questions. Um, so measurements are being conducted at the curation facilities, at the curation facility about the density. So there is actually a distribution of density that is being measured. Um, so uh, this distribution is extremely uh, interesting. It will be included in the uh, paper that Yara and all uh, has been submitted and they will publish soon. So you will see this distribution, this paper. So I, I cannot show it now, but let me say that this distribution is very, very, very interesting because it, it confirms somehow that the material is, uh, is very, uh, has, has very low density. Also, when you have a look at individual grains, so that was very surprising to me. Um, some grains are, are, are really, uh, uh, must be very fluffy or porous in order to have such a small density. So mm -hmm. I, I believe that's gonna be very, very interesting. Uh, and, uh, and also that, that, that is also a challenge for manipulating these grains, as you can see. Uh, another point is that about the size distribution is that uh, the, the grains, although, although Rigu has, you've, you've seen these images, Rigu has so many boulders, it seems more like a rocky surface, right? Than a dusty surface, but the material is extremely fragile. So it breaks very easily. Uh, and so the size distribution that you see here is probably not a native size distribution. We believe that, you, you remember the way Hayabusa 2 collected uh, the samples was by firing a little projectile and by uh, taking basically the, the small grains. Yeah, so we believe that even that little shot uh, will uh, alter the actual uh, size distribution. So it is possible that the size distribution that we are seeing here is not native. Uh, maybe even the trip uh, and the re-entry of the capsule in the, uh, in the Earth atmosphere might have changed a little bit the size distribution. We'll see. So there are preliminary studies that are being conducted. Yes. So uh, this is going to be very important. But uh, when everybody, you know, when, when we all look at this first image that uh, JAXA released, um, the first reaction was, oh, wow, there are big grains in room C that are not seen in room A, right? And, and yeah, that's, that's true. There is a, in particular, there is one very large, I think it's this guy here, but there are also other guys that are very, very uh, big. There, there is one guy, which is I think one centimeter in size. So it's, it's, it's so maybe not, not, so, not so much, but maybe like eight millimeter or something like that. So uh, yeah, so in room A, we do not observe uh, those big, big guys, but uh, in the millimeter size, you have grains in both, uh, in both chambers. So again, uh, 
I don't know. I don't know if, uh, if this is the actual original size distribution, but, uh, but the grains uh, seem to be very fragile and, uh, and, the, uh, and they break easily. Um, yes, I think I can stop here for this. <laughs> okay, looking forward to seeing the, the results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Before going to the question by Fernando, can you say what is writing in Japanese? Oh, this is a, <laughs> this is a, um, it's a spurious, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't come from Ryugu. It's a, it's a contamination. Uh, it's, I think it's an aluminum uh, contamination that was uh, uh, clearly seen and, and removed. So uh, I think, I think the, the I, I'm, I don't speak Japanese, but I think the Japanese says, I think like uh, aluminum rich contamination or something like that. So it's artificial. artificial, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From the spacecraft or something. From the spacecraft, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I have to say this, just to make, uh, uh, this, the, uh, by, since we looked at the the, the actual grains already uh, remote, remotely, of course, from from France, but uh, we saw all the images. Uh, the the contamination is uh, almost absent. So really, this was one only one large contamination. That the rest of the collection is super clean. So um, so far, we haven't seen any uh, issues with contaminations. I would say. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Fernando. Fernando Tinot. Bueno. Go on. Hi, Rosario. Thanks Hi. for this inspiring talk. I mean, I really want to see those first results for this initial analysis. I'm wondering if there is any planned data release or an opportunity to propose some different analysis, as maybe in the ultraviolet that I'm working with. And yeah. Just know if there is there will be any data release and possibilities for for the rest of the of the people. Yeah, absolutely. So as I as I mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, the actual collection will be uh, uh, made available to the international community starting from June 2022. Mm -hmm. So you may actually submit your proposal and uh, and ask for grains uh, when the first uh, AO comes out in June 2022. And by that time, um, you will have a catalog of the uh, of the whole collection. Uh, I think JAXA will only release uh, 10 to 20 percent. I don't know if this fraction is confirmed here. You see, these are fractions um, because half of the, of the collection is preserved for posterity, as, as always done in these cases. And so the fraction that will be available for the uh, international community will be something like 10 to 15 percent, I think, maybe 20. I don't remember the exact number. But um, so within that, uh, you will have a catalog and the, the catalog will show you the characteristics, general characteristics of the grains. In particular, in the catalog, you will find information like the optical images, you will find an infrared spectrum, uh, you will find the size, you will find the density, the weight, and so on. And uh, regarding your questions about the UV, so uh, uh, if I go back to, yeah, to this sketch here. So the way JAXA structured this activity uh, was to basically build six groups and, um, of initial analysis, and these groups cover different topics. Uh, elements, isotopes, the mineralogy, the petrology, the volatiles, the organics, both insoluble and soluble. And so it is possible that within these groups, uh, there, there are some investigators, some researchers who are performing UV uh, measurements. Um, but in any case, this represents sort of a demonstrator of the uh, a demonstration of the richness of the collection. So it's not exhaustive. It's, you know, there's room for, I, I believe there will be room for, uh, for a lot of science to be done in the, in the AO. And, uh, and also the initial analysis uh, teams all, only have one year to, to publish their work. Uh, so of course, of course, some things will be done, but only, only a fraction of, uh, I think, of the science that can be done with this sample. So uh, yeah, I encourage you to do that. Yeah, so it will be released at the at the middle of my PhD. It will be nice. <laughs> Thank you. Remember, the quantities are small, of course. I don't know if your analysis requires a lot of material, but remember, the whole collection is only 5.4, 5.5 grams. So uh, if you if you apply for for materials, uh, you have to apply for individual grains or fragments of grains. So you have to think about that. Thank you very much, Fernando. There is another question by Yudong Wu. Please go on. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Yes. Hi. It's a very interesting talk. 
I really like that. And uh, I have several co co uh, questions, but I'm not doing with that research. So maybe the question is stupid. Uh, and the first is about the image. It's, a, it's an example taken from the uh, asteroid and uh, take it back to our Earth right now, right? Uh, say it again. Uh, is is those the um, the materials, the grains? Are yes. Are taken back to our Earth now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are actual grains that uh, these are the actual grains that were collected at the asteroids and and that are now on Earth. Yes. Ah, okay. So uh, I don't know because uh, uh, at your first talk, uh, I think in uh, in the slide in the beginning there have several several spectral copies for the asteroid, but uh, it's a it's a taken from the telescope on the ground or it's from the, yeah. Uh, yeah this. This image, yes. 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 Okay, yes. yeah. Yes. So the, uh, you have three spectra here, uh, the yes. black, the gray, and the red. And uh, yes. the red and the black were measured by Hayabusa 2, by the spacecraft, by two different instruments on board the spacecraft. And the gray was measured uh, by uh, on ground, let's say. Ah, okay. okay. And was rescaled, it was rescaled to match the albedo. But the other, <laughs> match the albedo of the visible uh, observation. But the other two, this is actually yes. interesting. Thanks for this question. This, uh, the other two measurements, you see the ONC and the nearest three uh, measurements are not scaled, are uh, plotted in this graph just yes. as just like they are, really. They, they, they were measured with this reflectance. So uh, there is a very nice, there is no overlap in terms of uh, wavelength coverage, but there is a nice uh, agreement in the sense that both instruments measured a very, very dark reflectance. For the surface of the asteroid. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, last question is: uh, if there have some survey, some survey for spectroscopy to identify if that uh, asteroid is from our galaxy or from outside the galaxy. This asteroid, you mean? Um, um, I mean the survey for any, any oh. or, yes. Okay. So the uh, okay. So this asteroid is uh, is a small asteroid that uh, yes. orbits around the sun. But uh, mm -hmm. it comes from, probably it comes from a family of asteroids that is in the main yeah. belt, in the main belt, I, yeah. uh, in the main asteroid belt. Yeah. So these are, uh, originally this, this asteroid was a fragment of the, the components of this asteroid were fragments of a larger body that was in the main belt, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is material of, of our solar system that was formed within our solar system, yes. So the spectroscopy can, help for identify if it come from our galaxy or from outside galaxy, right? Uh, well, we know that from the dynamical studies, basically. So we don't even know, oh, we don't even need the spectroscopy to do that. So the, the, ah, we know okay. that from dynamical studies. So it's- Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, to, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you, Gudon. Okay, any, any other question for Rosario? I want to ask, uh, talking about the origin, you show a, a slide, a sketch, where you talk about the, uh, the origin of the asteroid coming from a certain family. Yes, uh, I guess uh, it's this one, yeah. This one, okay. Ryugu is a, is a rubble bite, so uh, we cannot say that all the material that is forming Ryugu is coming from the same body that collide, for example. So. Uh, maybe it's a lot of, col of collision of different bodies and then Ryugu form it from a lot of small pieces, a lot of uh, dust coming from different collision. I mean, we cannot guarantee yeah. that we are talking about the same body that it was destroyed and then form it again. So the heterogeneity of the material yes. uh, need to be Addressed, yeah. No, yeah, Rene, you're right. This is a very important point. Uh, I, will, I will say a few words about that because it's a very important issue, yes. Um, so there are two uh, main observations here. Uh, one is uh, the asteroid is really homogeneous in terms of uh, its spectral properties uh, across the surface when you, when you look at it at scales that are larger than, uh, I would say, a few meters, okay? Uh, but at the same time, 
uh, when you look at the distribution of colors uh, measured by the camera of boulders, individual boulders, so the team of the camera led by Seiji uh, Sugita measured, uh, clearly showed that at the surface of view, you have boulders that have a very different uh, spectral behavior in the visible. And they identify two types of boulders that are somehow, well, we, we can call them exo exogenous material, but let's, let's say different material, different boulders from the rest. And these two are, uh, one, is, one, one type of these boulders uh, is more like S type. So it has a clear uh, spectral signature that are similar to typical S type asteroids. So silicate rich asteroids. Uh, and the other type of boulders uh, is more C type, but C type in a way that is different from Ryugu. So it has different slope and different albedo. Uh, you can clearly see that in the images of the camera, but you can also see that in the images produced by the thermal um, imaging spectrometer. So they have different uh, thermal properties, different thermal inertia, for instance. So that's, that's clearly sign uh, testifying for a different composition. So based on these two evidences, uh, I believe this sketch come from from this from the so this was published by SAG in 2019 and I believe that th this sketch comes from these two main evidences the fact that on one hand the asteroid seems to be very homogeneous but so so even in craters for instance you don't see much variation of the spectra but you have at the surface of the asteroid boulders that are clearly of a different composition they they're not very abundant they're not you know they represent a small minority of course of boulders but so that's why they uh, speculated about the fact that it, at least one of the impactors, maybe they, we had many impactors, we don't know, but at least one of them must have been an S-type body. And maybe another one could have been a C-type body. Uh, so that's why uh, they talk about maybe different epochs also of, impact, of impacts. Um, and probably they, well, they suspect that the, uh, the, the, the first big impact was done was say an S-type aster was responsible for that. Uh, so, and as you said, we re-accreted fragments also from this other body, which have nothing in common with the, uh, with the uh, rest of you. So yes, but the, I, I think there is still room for improving this. And, uh, and actually one of the questions that will be uh, um, interesting in terms of the sample return is that if, if, that, if that is true, so if we accreted also sam, uh, sample coming from an S-type asteroid, then it is possible that we see that also at the small scale. So it, it might be possible that also within these little fragments, we might have some contaminants, I would say, from S-type or, or C-types that are different. And it's, it is true when you look at the images in more detail, it is true that it seems, well, even if I cannot say much, but I would say that um, many grains uh, have similar properties, but it is true that sometimes you have the impression of having like little different lithologies, morphology uh, of material that is different, that it's the shape and the, the texture, the texture of the grains are different. So th there is a lot of, I think there is a lot of science to do uh, with that. And the, I think some of the uh, initial analysis systems will address this question. Uh, but yeah, this, this, it's certainly a very, very important point here. Yeah. Some grains <clears throat> you can see in the, in the previous image are brighter. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, there are grains that show uh, inclusions. Uh, so, yes, you can see that already in this image. Actually, there are grains which are extremely dark. Uh, other grains show um, inclusions, uh, small inclusions which are brighter, and other grains show even uh, maybe not inclusions, but more like re really regions uh, at the surface which are much brighter than the rest. Uh, so these differences are real. And, uh, and we are investigating uh, what is the cause of this, what is the, comp the actual composition that is producing these differences. Well, yeah, like a rubble pile, precisely by definition, could be made a pile of rubble made from that house, that uh, which yeah. means some experience there, but another house can bring yes. another bricks or whatever to the big pile. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Any other question for Rosario? I think it's enough and we can we can finish here. Isabel, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, um, I want to, to say again, thank you. 
to Rosario for such an interest in it, it is it is uh, that far from my own uh, field of research and and even though I, I find it extremely interesting so thank you very much and I'm, I insist on the, on say uh, on asking you to come here when possible you'll be fine to change uh, some sure. some other results here in in person so thank you very much thank you all and I hope to see you soon in person yes absolutely Okay, thank you, Rosario.